Centro Alemão de Ciência e Inovação de São Paulo faz parte de uma rede de cinco centros. Nós temos um centro em Nova York, um em Moscou, um em Nova Delhi e um em Tóquio. E essa rede de centros está hoje dentro do DAD. O DAD é o Serviço Alemão de Intercâmbio Acadêmico. E nós somos uma organização que representa as instituições do ensino superior na Alemanha. E nosso objetivo é de promover a internacionalização dos estudos superiores no mundo inteiro. O encontro das pessoas, dos grupos de pesquisadores, das universidades é muito importante e isso é uma base da nossa cooperação com o Brasil mesmo. A cooperação entre duas comunidades científicas é muito produtiva, em geral causando impactos sempre maiores do que iniciativas de pesquisa feitas isoladamente. A Deveirá, como a sociedade científica aqui, que tem uma ciência de excelência absoluta e alta tecnologia, é extremamente proveitosa essas parcerias. E a parceria entre o setor privado e o mundo científico é fundamental para promover as relações bilaterais. Bom dia, guten Tag, good afternoon, hello everybody around the world. It's fine to be here again with you for our third session of our DVH São Paulo online talk series Surviving, Living and Shaping the Future in the Time of COVID-19. My name is Marcio Weichert and I am the program manager of the German Center for Research and Innovation in São Paulo. So before we start, some notification. Although both uh, speakers today are Brazilians, they will talk in English because this is an international event. The original sound of this online talk in English is available on this platform Adobe Connected. But for the first time, we are offering a translation to Portuguese on our channel DVIH Brasil, DWIH Brasil, ou DWIH Brasil, on YouTube. So, this online talk is being recorded, including the chat conversation. The record video will be later available on our YouTube channel in both languages. By participating in the event and chat, It means that you are authorize us to record and publish your images, voices and what you write in the chat. So for the welcome speech today, I want to invite Nora Jacobs, head of the board of the German Center, is speaking from Cologne. Hello, Nora. <laughs> Hello, sorry for the day. Hi, Nora. Today we have kind of a common with our technical <laughs> <laughs> problems. Uh, yeah, I'm in, in Cologne today and it's uh, the late summer we're experiencing this week. So it's very nice to go out in the parks and gather having uh, such nice temperatures. <laughs> so I will continue. Yeah, I see you're talking. And um, I'm very pleased that we are jointly organizing this um, event to address an audience based in Germany or Brazil or elsewhere. My name, as Marcia said, is Nora Jacobs. I'm the current chairperson of the local advisory board of the German Center. And I'm now based in Berlin and today in Cologne. And I'm welcoming you and would like to give a short introduction to this um, online talk series. Marcia already stated the name. It's called Surviving, Living and Shaping in the Future, Shaping the Future in the Time of COVID-19. And we're now in the third part where we're talking about the effects um, that the pandemic is having. We had two prior editions where we were speaking about the search for medicine and uh, vaccines against COVID. And in the second ones, we were facing or talking about the social behavior 
public health and social inequality during uh, current time. Now for the talk today, the German Center has invited Professors Daniel Machin Gibarros and Professor Marcelo Pereira do Amaral. They will present their research and the session will be moderated by Professor Markus Bukaric, who is the director of the Biosciences Institute at USP, University of Sao Paulo. And yeah, we are um, since a few months with the coronavirus crisis facing not only new challenges like lockdown or quarantine, but we are also seeing an uh, increase of the already existing problems like social inequality. The universities um, in particular, they had to move their learning and teaching online. And yeah, me, myself, I'm working from home as many of you are doing this today as well. And we are, we are now experiencing um, by this a reconfiguration of space somehow. And I'm very curious um, for this talk today, whether changes on society and science will be considered long lasting by you. I think uh, this is the case and what we will have to do, or how we will develop a sustainable so social change, uh, speaking in more general terms and how we create convivial spaces at the university again in particular. Professor Daniel Machin Chibarus, he will be focusing more on the consequences of the pandemic in human behavior. And Professor Marcelo Bajeda do Amaral will speak more about the effects on, in higher education. So I'm very, look, very much looking forward to this um, presentation and to the following discussion and we'll hand over or back to Marcio. Thank you very much and enjoy the talk. <laughs> Thank you, Nora. Thank you very much. So, apologize us uh, for the technical uh, problems that uh, we had in the beginning of our uh, transmission, but it seems that uh, the app was uh, automatically uh, changing uh, some layouts here uh, of our transmission. Sorry for that. Uh, yes, thank you, Nora. Uh, before I hand over to the moderator of the talk, I want to ask you to answer a short survey about the profile of our audience. It will stay open for one minute. If you are watching us on YouTube, you are not able to answer this service by a click on the screen. You need to write your answer in the chat. Please do it. The first question is from where are you watching this event? We are very curious to know your city and country. If you are following us on Adobe Connect, please can complete your answer informing your city in the chat. The second question addresses your activity. Are you a student, researcher, teacher or other of the suggested options? One minute was over very fast. Uh, so, time is up. Uh, after the presentations of our speakers, we will continue with the survey with new questions. And at the end of the event, you will have more time to complete the survey if you need. So, it's time to hand over to Professor Markus Bakarich, Director of the Institute of Biosciences of at the University of São Paulo, USP, that will moderate a talk with our invited speakers. Both of them are Brazilian researchers, but researching in different countries. From Germany, we have the honor in receiving Marcelo Parreira do Amaral, professor at the University of Münster, and from Brazil, Daniel de Barros from the University of São Paulo. They will share with us their visions about the future after the COVID-19 pandemic particularly in higher education, society, and individual behavior. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Marcio. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, Anna. Uh, uh, today uh, is the third talk that we have uh, in the sequence. Uh, the theme, as, as was said before, is shaping the future of society in higher education. We have two very interesting talks. Uh, 
Uh, I will start with uh, Professor Marcelo Pereira do Amaral, and then we follow to uh, Professor Daniel Martins Barros. Uh, both are Brazilians, as was said, and but both are going to to talk in English. Every one of our talkers will will have uh, our speakers will have uh, fifteen minutes, and I will let them know when uh, uh, ten minutes have passed. And then again, uh, when two minutes are left, Professor uh, Marcelo Parreira do Amaral is a full professor of education at the Institute of Education of the University of Münster, Germany. Uh, Pereira do Amaral teaches and researches in the field of uh, comparative and international education, education, education policy studies, lifelong learning, and education institutes. Uh, his current research focuses international education policy and governance issues at various levels of uh, and scale. More recently, his work concentrated concentrated on the emergence. And expansion of a global education industry and how it is transforming conceptualizations of good education. His research on uh, new uh, providers uh, and policy actors within education aims at analyzing the possible consequences for education research, policy, and practice. Beyond discerning particular expressions and uh, manifestations of the global education industry phenomenon in international contexts, it also looks into the rationales, processes, and impacts of the global education industry developments on the education system. Barrera do Amaral has collaborated to uh, and coordinated several international education, educational research projects. From 2016 to 2019, he coordinated the ongoing project Young Adult. Uh, which refers to uh, policies supporting young people in their life works. A comparative perspective of lifelong learning and uh, inclusion in education and work in Europe. This project is funded by the European Commission under the Horizon, Horizon 2020 research framework. Pereira do Amaral is also a member of the NET, NISET 2 network of experts uh, on the social aspects of education funded by the European Commission. Uh, Professor Marcelo, thank you very much for attending. Oh, uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I am happy to participate in this uh, event today. Um, good morning to Brazil, good afternoon to uh, all others in Europe. Um, I'd like to organize my input today along um, uh, three main uh, themes. The topic, imagining, fabricating, and contesting the future of higher education, geopolitical transformations in times of crisis, um, will be dealt with uh, along uh, the, these uh, topics. The, the context or the contexts uh, in which higher education uh, is um, discussed as being in crisis and in which the current COVID-19 pandemics has contributed a new dynamics. Um, second, I'll briefly uh, speak about imaginations and fabrications of the future of higher education, but also I will talk about important contestations of these developments. And I'll close um, with a few remarks on the implications of this for higher education. Now, let me briefly remark on the context, and, or rather the context of the theme we're discussing today. Um, education in general, but higher education and science in particular, have become central issues uh, in imaginations of the future. Their roles in shaping and actually in wealth and uh, welfare cannot be, be overestimated in uh, discussed such as um, the knowledge society or the knowledge-based economy. Um, in this, uh, 
uh, education and science have become a fixed idea, um, a constant topos in the imaginations of knowledge intensive capitalism, and of how it is to contribute to innovative economic growth. How higher education is, however, also invoked as the prime locus of production, both of proprietary knowledge, such as patents, innovations uh, of all kinds, and, and so, forth, so, so far. And of course, also of human capital and the related subjects and subjectivities that are needed in this bright future. In, the, in these terms, education and science have become uh, to be seen as assets that play central roles in generating both value and comparative advantages in the images of global competitiveness and uh, of transnational value chains. And it is understanding how higher education and science have become key features of the knowledge-based economy uh, that invite us, uh, us to inquire into the transformative effects of this new, as I would like to term, geopolitics of knowledge. In, including, and this is the focus today, uh, of how it is constructed, how it is fabricated. Um, if we think about how uh, science, uh, education and, and universities, higher education in general, um, is talked about, attributes such as entrepreneurial, intentional, digital, virtual, embedded, disruptive, or simply world-class give expression to the visions of the future of education, science, or the university more generally. The debates, uh, both in policy and in academia, are full of references to the ut utmost importance of reforming, transforming, or rather, one could say, transfiguring higher education. To some extent, this is a, a, a topos, an idea that's well known to, uh, in the history of education. Um, as it was, were, um, there is no salvation outside higher education. There was a famous uh, paper in the 60s um, uh, dealing with the importance of higher education in society. Um, the voices in these discourses incessantly hint at the emergency state, uh, that is, higher education is in crisis, it's, it's on the verge and on the edge of catastrophe, and solutions uh, that are presented by some advocates are proposed as, as if there is no alternative. COVID-19 has functioned uh, here as a catalyzer for those uh, proposing solu solutions and has lent a fresh sense of urgency. It has, has also created a new context in which higher education institutions were faced with the need to adapt swiftly to the changed uh, contexts of uh, virtual online-based instruction. And this has uh, laid bare long-known issues uh, related to teaching and teaching quality, but also uh, uh, related to the infrastru infrastructure and the actual the, the reality of mass uh, universities. But it has also provoked new ones. Um, in this, uh, it is in this context that specific imaginations of the future um, of higher education gain traction and become effective in shaping public opinion and in turn uh, also policymaking. I'd like to briefly turn some attention uh, to one such example. A topical example of how the future of universities has been uh, the subject of imaginations and indeed calculations of global experts aiming at strengthening the link between higher education and the economy can be found in, uh, in the work of the University Industry Interaction Network. The network based in Amsterdam and with a chapter in Australia was founded in 2012 and um, as it um, displays on its uh, homepage. It, is, it aims to exploit the full value of collaboration and cooperation um, of universities and industry. 
in order to drive and facilitate inclusive growth, entrepreneurial ecosystems and innovation districts through regional engagement. Although the network is an independent think tank, activities are often supported by large corporations as uh, Siemens um, and others. Uh, and it also provides services to the European Commission. And uh, through collaboration with the latter, um, uh, it has, has received direct and indirect funding, um, um, for example, for projects. In 2018, the network published uh, an interesting uh, um, thought book, the Future of Universities Thought Book. It features 40 imaginations of the future uh, of universities in 2040. As the editors argued, while predicting the future is impossible and futile, they never, nevertheless invited authors from various fields related to industry business uh, relations to sub submit their views on, as they say, possible futures. The University 4.0, as they phrased, is seen as a higher education institution in which academics and students work in real time, symbiotic partnerships with industry, government and societal stakeholders to simultaneously create and implement new knowledge and solutions to address business and social issues. Um, this is in itself an interesting imagination of, of the future of higher education. Unfortunately, I don't have time for a second one, which is uh, even more concrete in shaping uh, the future, um, not only imagining, but also actively, proactively shaping the future of higher education. This is the Minerva project, a virtual uh, a university founded as a startup in California that proposed uh, to build an intentional university. Now, let me briefly comment, briefly comment on the fabrications uh, you can find in the thought book. The thought book leaves nothing untouched in how the university of the future is to look like. Nothing that we known, uh, know as university becomes uh, uh, state, remains the same. Its self, self understandings, its missions, relationships with society and economy, its institutional modes and models, and not least, also its purposes are to be remodeled to have a future, a future that does not lead to catastrophe. A, close, a closer in, in examination shows uh, that uh, well-known themes perspire. For example, a focus on evidence on what works and what matters, fixing education and science in a positivistic epistemology, and also amidst the, uh, the debates, an illusion uh, is made between excellent and relevance that is often devoid of com uh, content um, simply by appearing in um, a ranking uh, is seen as excellence. Um, further, the, the rationales for reforming are premised on a shared value notion that merges public and market interests. According to its proponents, shared value in education is not philanthropy or corporate responsibility. Instead, it is a business approach that increases profits uh, by improving the effectiveness of education systems at scale. Uh, so it wants to um, capitalize on what the state does not uh, uh, achieve. And uh, one could see this as a specific version, version of capitalism um, as one op alternative to uh, the state. The market in, indeed appears as having no alternative, as the only actor able to provide sustainable solutions, or at least as crucial for su success in terms of public-private partnerships. And uh, a bright future here is only possible if innovation is, uh, if disruptive change uh, takes place. One is tempted to say uh, here COVID-19 presented one such uh, window of opportunity for disruption. 
let me move on and uh, start uh, and uh, without uh, mentioning the large bulk of, uh, of literature and public interventions contesting these develop developments in one way or another. Some of this of these um, some of this literature challenge radically uh, the development towards an entrepreneurial university in which questions, questions are cast aside when not in line with uh, instrumental goals. Others question the hegemonic role of Western knowledge and propose a pluriversity of concurring uh, worldviews. Still others deliberate on the possibility uh, of a digital university that does not sacrifice its uh, social and political responsibilities on the altar of economic efficiency. Uh, indeed, contestation uh, also takes the form of examining uh, the premises of the arguments proposed by the advocates of the bright new future uh, of knowledge intensive capitalism and its own uh, preferred version of higher education. This includes scrutinizing the choice architecture shaping the future of higher education. In, instead of a conclusion, I'd like to rather point to some open questions raised by the distinction uh, I've made uh, between economic and pluriversal imaginations of the future of higher education. In a similar fashion to the current pandemics, the scope of these uh, discussions is global. COVID-19 has faced higher education worldwide with similar changes, uh, has met higher education systems in quite different ways, but from uh, the perspective of this global education industry uh, um, debate, one can see that it uh, has created a host of possibilities and opened uh, windows of opportunity for many. From the perspective of higher education research, which is uh, what I am uh, doing right now, three main tasks command attention. And here, the new dynamics brought about by the current pandemic, uh, pandemic crisis introduce, I think, a new urgency. And the three are examining the role of research and attending uh, more closely to its deeper political, social, and ethical dimensions. Um, it includes focusing the impact of these manufactured crises on policy and governance and how they affect uh, the operation of uh, and the policy making in higher education, but also uh, looking to inside the uh, university, attending to how this affects uh, academic careers and subjectivities, and not least, also the day-to-day -day lives of uh, students. Uh, I'll finish here, and I'm looking forward to discussing uh, the topics with you now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcelo. Uh, thank you for keeping the time uh, for the excellent talk. Uh, I will now uh, pass the word uh, to Professor Daniel Martins Barros. Uh, he is a collaborating professor uh, at the Department of uh, Psychiatry of the School of Medicine of the University of São Paulo and a physician at the Institute of Psychiatrists of the Hospital das Clínicas, one of the main hospitals we have in the city of São Paulo. He has a PhD in sciences and a, a bachelor's degree in philosophy uh, from the University of São Paulo. An interesting CV, uh, actually. He's a columnist of the newspaper portal O Estado de São Paulo, one of the largest uh, newspapers in, in Brazil, and uh, Radio Band News FM, also a one of the most important uh, radio stations that we have uh, focused on news in, 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 in Brazil, actually, and a consultant of the Bainstar program the, from Ready Global, which is the main station, uh, uh, TV station in the, in the country. 
he maintains the Daniel Martins Barbers channel on the YouTube. So if you want to see uh, more of him, uh, and the subject there is about the brain and the behavior in general. Uh, we are very curious to hear you, Professor Daniel. Uh, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you, Marcos, for the words. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, actually, I am a, a huge fan uh, from a specific German product. Yes, I am a board game fan, <laughs> and uh, I don't know if everybody here knows that, but uh, the German board game designers are among the best of the world, and I am a, a huge fan. So uh, I'm happy to strengthen my relationship, my relationship with uh, German here at uh, the VIH event. And it's, uh, it's an honor to, to be here to talk about the pandemic and the emotions that are so present nowadays uh, in everybody's life, mainly the negative emotions. Yes, it will be a lecture uh, and a talk about negative emotions because I don't know if you are very relaxed, if you are very... Um, if, if you don't, if, if, you, if in the moment you have no concerns, you are relaxed, you don't know, you may not know, but we have a, a very big problem in the world called COVID-19. COVID uh, and I, I say that because everybody since March asked me, Daniel, uh, I'm not feeling so good, I'm not feeling well. I'm concerned, I'm anxious, I'm a, a little bit of sad, you know, I'm not feeling quite well. And the only thing I can say is very good for you. You are in a normal shape now. Uh, people who are now very relaxed, they have a problem. Uh, they shouldn't be very relaxed. We are in the midst of, uh, of the most important health and economic and educational as you have as we have seen right now crisis of the world no our generation and <laughs> it's been a while that no one has seen such a huge problem so that's why i think it's important we think about emotions and how to deal with our emotions mainly the negative ones. As a matter of fact, it was a coincidence that in March, in the first, in the very, very first week of March, I uh, released an, my new book, which was specifically about negative emotions. It's called O Lado Bom Do Lado Ruim, uh, the good side of the bad side. And it's not about silver lining. It's not about seeing the bright side of the tragedy. It's not to, it's not uh, intent to uh, show us that pandemic has a good side. No, the main focus of the book is to understand why do we feel bad? Why do we have negative emotions? And what, which is the, their purpose? It all began because. Uh, I, I have been looking in um, bookshops and self-help shelves and I've, I was kind of tired of titles like Get Rid of Your Anxiety, You Don't Have to Be Sad, uh, Never Get Anger Again. And I thought, well, that's not working with me. I, kept, uh, I keep feeling sad. I keep getting angry, uh, I, I keep being anxious, so there's must, there must be a purpose for this emotion. It's not coincidence that they are installed in, in our brains like a, a pre-installed app that we just cannot get rid of. So um, it was a coincidence because I was researching for this book for about uh, an, a whole year 
and then uh, six months writing the book and six months editing the book uh, and when I was to uh, launch the book, to, to release the book, the pandemic broke. Uh, the event, the presential event, we had to cancel and so we had just online events to uh, promote the book and so on and so forth. But uh, it was a, a very happy coincidence because it has helped us and many of the, the readers and, and it has shaped my lectures because we now are facing uh, a rise in sadness, in fear, in anger and we ought to know what is the purpose of this emotion, why they do exist in the first place. Let's take fear for example. Uh, nobody likes to feel uh, anxiety, nobody likes stress, but of course we can imagine that fear has a very, very important hold in our lives. The fear sent us to the future. The fear, uh, the anxiety, and I'm using them as a synonymous here for the purpose of uh, this lecture, it shows us that there may be threats ahead. In the future, or in the immediate, immediate future, or even a little longer, uh, there are amenities, there are threats that we should get prepared to them. We should be alert, we should uh, run, we should fight, we should deal with these threats, which everyone can understand. It's very useful uh, when the deer uh, senses the lion, the best thing he has to do is to run away or if uh, he is not able to run away, to freeze, hoping that the lion doesn't see him. The problem with us humans is that we have a huge imagination. And where animals just feel threats that are near or that are possible, they, uh, the, the, the worst that can happen to them is to be wrong and then they run away and, and there was no lion. Let's take the example of a deer. He, he senses a lion, he runs away, but there was no lion. Well, he loses nothing. But we humans, with our huge imagination, we start to see menaces, threats, where they are really not present. We imagine problems. We go so far ahead in the future and we suffer because of that. It was Mark Twain that said uh, that he has gone through terrible things in his life. Some of them that really happened. So the majority of the terrible things were only on his imagination. So, um, we ought to know that uh, anxiety makes us prone to deal with menaces, but the menaces are not all real, are not all probable, probable. they are not all, uh, they, they, most of them are only in our imagination. When you get to know that, we can choose our battles. So. Must I really be scared with the uh, economic crisis? What can I really do to deal with the dollar rate? Uh, it's useless for me to be afraid of the economic crisis because I cannot run from for it. I, uh, from it, uh, I shouldn't run for it. <laughs> I cannot run from the economic crisis. So uh, why must I have? Tachycardia, why must I have uh, this whole anxiety um, reaction since I cannot by myself deal with it? It's very important to choose the battles because fear has another important characteristic that is very, very useful for us in the pandemic. In, uh, there are evidences mainly from the United Kingdom that in previous epidemics they were they were getting ready they were preparing themselves for a pandemic uh, of influenza but 
the pandemic of influenza didn't came came an, a pandemic of a new uh, new disease but with the the data that they gathered they have seen that people in the in the, uh, in the midst of a pandemic of an epidemic people who don't fear people who think they are immune or they are not the risk population, or they are not especially vulnerable to that disease, they don't take precautions. They don't get um, secure. They don't wash their hands. They don't uh, use masks. So here it's important for us to go through this pandemic. And people often ask me, Daniel, how can I get rid of my fear to get my life back, to go to work, to leave my house. And I say, don't get rid of your fear. We have just to adjust it. Because fear, it's very important. It's like the, the, those escalators, alpinists. Um, once I talked to one of them, and I said, don't you get anxious? Don't you feel fear? And he said, of course. Without the fear, I would be at risk. I wouldn't prepare myself. I wouldn't uh, take the uh, security measures, and I wouldn't be able to enjoy the view and enjoy my rides through the top of a, mo a mountain. So, fear is very important important for us, and we should look inside, looking for our own emotions, thinking about them, discern what is the fear that I must feed, what's the fear that I must get rid of. Speaking of choosing our, our battles, that's something that happens uh, with anger too. Anger is an emotion that came, came from uh, animals that were in dispute. Dispute for property, dispute for um, uh, foraging, uh, mating, space. Not property. Property is a, a human thing. They were disputing for uh, space and mating, uh, foraging, and so on. It was an inner species emotion. It's not the deer that tries to scare the lion. The deer runs from the lion. Uh, it's one lion to the other that wants to show that he's braver, stronger, uh, than the other should run. It's not a good fight to, to get in. And that's what happened in nature. Um, they, they may fight a little bit, but often one is able to scare the other, and the other says or shows the defeat and goes away. So anger is installed in your brain with this purpose for us to get in into disputes, for us to uh, say, this is mine, this is not yours, I should have this right. And in the pandemic, especially in the quarantine, where we are confined in one space, disputing uh, the sofa, disputing the remote control, disputing the uh, computer use, uh, anger has risen among our families, among uh, our lives, in our lives, and it's very important to know that, uh, that, that this, this emotion shows us that we are in dispute, because uh, in humans it's not only property and space, but we, we also uh, dispute rights. So when we think we are in a position of injustice, we get anger. If uh, someone in the house is cooking and is doing the dishes and is cleaning the house and is taking care of everything. This person, of course, will feel uh, will feel just uh, will feel that there's that it's not just uh, and will feel anger. So we have to make an arrangement. We have to uh, set what anyone what each of each of one, each one of us will do. I will do the dishes. You will cook. I will manage the kids today. You manage the kids tomorrow. If you have these arrangements, we can tape down our anger. Of course, 
if we follow so the rules, if we follow, if, if we follow our agreements. And doing so, okay. Thank you. And doing so, we we uh, I can I would like to uh, end talking about sadness because sadness is an emotion that makes us look inside. When we are happy, we are in a party, we don't think about anything, but when we are sad, we think, oh, I, I wouldn't like to, uh, this to happen, I didn't like uh, losing this, or uh, I regret losing that, or um, I am grieving for someone who departed. So, um, sadness shows us what is really important. There are things that we've lost in this pandemic that we were happy to lose, um, things that didn't matter. But there are things that we lost that make, uh, made us sad. And these things is what really matters. Sadness, it's important. It came together with uh, happy, happiness. It's like um, a combo. We just get sad for something that made us happy in the past. Happiness and sadness are a combo that we, the only way you will not be sad is if you don't feel happy for anything. I don't care about anything, so I will not regret losing anything. If you understand a little bit of these emotions, I think we can um, learn some lessons from the pandemic. Pandemic is not a teacher. Pandemic does have an intention to teach us anything, but we can learn some lessons. We can learn what is really important. Pandemic is like a magnifying glass that uh, shows the problems, enhances problems that are already there. Gender difference, education problems, um, uh, the um, old people uh, isolation. So, if we pay attention to what we are feeling, maybe we can learn some lessons from uh, the pandemic and these negative emotions that we don't like to feel, they may be uh, a very, uh, some very important messages to help us shape the future, uh, maybe a better future uh, that the, the, the past normal. We don't like, uh, there, are, there are some things that were normal that we don't want back. So let's pay attention to our own emotions and learn the lessons to shape a better future. I once again thank you for the opportunity and looking forward to uh, Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for your presentation. Congratulations on the books. Uh, you have a previous book as well, right? Uh, um, I'll, I'll start uh, uh, privileging the, the questions that were asked by our, uh, the people that was watching us. But before, uh, we are going to have two minutes for the uh, for our form to be filled, would you please share that? We allowed out about one minute for you to answer, please. Okay, we have uh, um, I asked the professors to start their com 
here coming as well. Thank you, Marcelo. I'll start. Uh, uh, we have uh, some questions uh, for Professor Amaral. Uh, it, I'll start. You, you're probably seeing it uh, there. Uh, it is uh, Laura Laura Redondo. Uh, thank you very much for your for your talk. In your opinion, how can we build governance? of uh, higher education that minimizes or refrains the siege uh, of uh, knowledge by the private sector uh, and at the same time enables or attracts funding from the industry to cut to cutting edge research. Professor, mm -hmm. Professor Amaral. Uh, the, the, uh, I, I wish I had the <laughs> A compelling answer to, to this, um, but what I I would uh, contribute to this uh, question is that um, a main question is uh, on, on what terms we build a governance uh, a system of higher education and how we shape policy making in higher education. Um, much of the debate. Uh, uh, surrounding reforming of uh, higher education, uh, as I hinted in my uh, in my presentation, has this TINA argument. TINA is uh, the acronym for there is no alternative, and um, and this is actually not the case. Uh, even uh, in the research we've been conducting in the past two years, show um, that. Um, much of what is happening, um, so the impact of the private sector in higher education in terms of not only of privatization, but also of more generally the commodification and economization of the higher education sector is not uh, despite the, the state action. So the state is uh, an enabler of uh, what is going on uh, around around the globe. So um, here there is um, need for us to discuss on on what terms. If uh, governments uh, simply um, adopt um, strategies from the private sector uh, in in their policies um, without uh, caring too much about um, the um, the social dislocations that this prov uh, provokes, uh, this can become uh, a very um, problematic um, or a even more problematic situation than uh, it is already uh, the case. Uh, I think in, in one sentence, it is not simply uh, not, not a simple question to, to build a governance uh, of higher education that uh, keeps the balance, but also keeping uh, the, the the space for deliberation open for uh, for us to decide on the terms of this governance system. Uh, thank you, thank you, Marcelo. Uh, I'll I'll now pass the word to make a question to Daniel Barros. Uh, Daniel. Uh, you mentioned the the, the issue of uh, property uh, and uh, in in animals. I'm a biologist, right? so in in animals, uh, one what what we could call property uh, is the territory. Right? So what what we are doing is uh, with the pandemics uh, is to uh, put too many rats in the cage, right? To, and so, how do you see that the the increase of population and the territory is is this uh, a, a problem uh, really that is uh, leading people to be sad or to have negative uh, feelings? Yes, that's true. Uh, I, I thought uh, I said space in my speech, but uh, I meant territory. And uh, there's a dispute. There's uh, continuously, né? Uh, continually, continuously a dispute for territory uh, among animals and among us. And uh, in, in our daily lives, 
we are not all the time together in our house. Uh, if we can make a parallel with animals, they are not all the time in the shelters. They go out for hunting, they go out for drinking water, and, and so on. And the same happens with us. We usually go out to work, the kids go out to school, uh, we can go to the streets, have a walk, ride a bike, and things like that. With the quarantine, we had, as you said, too many rats in the cage, and we started to dispute territory that didn't happen before. In the morning, uh, kids were at school, and maybe you could watch TV, and now they, everybody is in, uh, in, in the house, and there are not TVs for everyone, uh, and the remote control disputes, and, and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, the, the way around this, I think, is to make arrangements. It's to make it clear. So, uh, in the first place, uh, this time, uh, the, the remote control is, is mine, uh, and the afternoon is yours, I'll do the dishes, you do the cooking, and, and if we can manage to, to have these arrangements, maybe we can, if you, we follow them, we can, uh, we can tape down, we can uh, deal in a better way with our anger, because it's inevitable, inevitable, we cannot get uh, get rid of our anger, but we can deal with it in a better way. And it's interesting, uh, anger, we feel anger when we think a property or a right is being not uh, fully, um, we are being injustice. But sometimes uh, the, the right of that property is not written, it's only in our head. Who said that parking space was really mine? Uh, so, anger is sometimes a message that we are uh, in a naive position, thinking we have so many rights, everything is, ought to be ours. Maybe it's a message not for us to fight for our rights, but sometimes it's a, a message for us to let some things go, things that we thought it was are right, but now, on a second thought, it's not written that it's my parking space or it's my remote control, so uh, it's a message that we ought to understand, and we can only do that if we look inside and face our negative emotions. The, the point is that many times we don't like to face our negative emotions, uh, we close our ears and say, no, I, I don't want to feel anything of this, but we have to face it to get the right message. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Let me, let me put one question again to Professor Amaral. Uh, uh, how do you access the initiatives of the EU level, the EU level, for uh, the European Union level, uh, for the near future, such as the European Education Area uh, and the Universities of the Future, based on President Macron's uh, initiative, for the new Erasmus uh, European Union Framework programs. It seems as if those initiatives are interconnected or better partially uh, followed up uh, on the approaches of uh, on the approaches you presented. Um, yeah, um, this is um, um, an issue that is ongoing, so um, a, a complete uh, assessment of it uh, is difficult. From, from the uh, um, perspective, um, I am looking at them, they, you can see their uh, geopolitical dimension. This is Europe. Uh, competing or trying to compete with other world regions, uh, basically competing with Asia, uh, competing with the US, um, uh, and, and so on. Um, this is a, a more uh, recent uh, dimension of higher education policy that we 
are still to understand global regionalisms uh, uh, of the type type of ASEAN, uh, European Union, uh, Mercosur, and uh, and others um, have all uh, um, a decidedly uh, higher education dimension, an educational dimension, but also a higher education component in them. So and this is um, why we can also see, at least in the European Union, um, an alignment uh, to the priorities, or uh, as the, the new framework program uh, calls it, the missions. Um, this has had a positive and negative impact on, on higher education uh, policy. For some disciplinary fields, this has meant a lot of more funding and a lot of more uh, opportunities. For others, uh, it meant a streamlining or a mainstreaming of uh, research for, for the field. I am, I've, I'm, uh, I've been working on uh, social sciences uh, more generally in education in particular. Uh, this has meant uh, uh, becoming integrated uh, and basically um, becoming of second importance to uh, economic uh, priorities. And this has had a, an impact on the epistemic governance of, of uh, disciplines in education, for example. One can uh, see the, um, uh, the changes in um, the debate uh, and a, a very decided uh, influence of political um, yeah, voices in um, in uh, in the debate by means of funding, uh, pro uh, project fund, or uh, the um, in in general, funding is one aspect, but also in terms of um, possibilities to be included in other um, aspects of um, social policy, for example. Um, here, my assessment is um, ambivalent. Um, it depends rather um, on which side of the disciplinary uh, field. There is also uh, in, in research and um, in the academia a hierarchy of, uh, of disciplinary fields, and this becomes more competitive. But also another aspect of it is the, this division of labor between um, universities and uh, non-university research um, uh, institutions. And here funding has been re relocated towards the um, non-university research centers, um, making problems for uh, university funding even more difficult right now. Uh, thank you, Marcelo. Uh, let's switch a little bit to the politics. One, there is one question for for each of you uh, on that, and I'll start with uh, Daniel. Uh, the question is from Marcio Weichart, our host uh, here. Uh, what is the what's the role of government, the repre government representatives, media, schools? religion and uh, uh, in the building of, of uh, fear or happiness by facing the pandemic. How strong are they influenced? I think Marshall wants to know if one of them would influence more than the others or if they are sort of similar. Uh, we can say without doubt that they are very influenced. Uh, they they have the power to shape our view of the moment. All of these players, uh, I can't say for sure which one is more powerful than other because it will depend on uh, individuals. Some 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 people um, value more their priests' uh, talks. Some people uh, value more the president talk and so on. But uh, there's no doubt that 
these the, these representatives, these public public figures, they have a power to shape our view of the moment. One thing that I start say started saying from the beginning of the quarantine and the pandemic is uh, it was for people to refrain from watching TV uh, or listening to news or reading to newspaper 24 hours uh, 7, 24 hours 7 days a week. Because if we were to be exposed to number of deaths, to counting of uh, contaminated, to the risks and the risks and only the risks, uh, we should get sick. Uh, anxiety would be a disorder in our lives. Because if you are in your home, if you are quarantined, uh, in quarantine, if you're washing your hands, if you're using your masks, uh, maybe you have a little chance to get sick, to, to get COVID-19, yeah, but you are in general safe. But your brain doesn't know if uh, that you're safe if you're continuously exposed to number of deaths and so on. So, uh, the message, uh, but it's a tricky uh, moment because we cannot, we, can, we must inform, we must show the numbers to the people, we cannot uh, hide the, the information and the responsibility, I think, it's on uh, the people. Uh, Govern, the, the government and the media and the priests and the teachers, they must tell the truth. But they, uh, I don't know if I, I'm clear with, it's tricky because you cannot hide the information, but if, if, we, if it's the only thing we see, it's this information, we will get sick. So, uh, to, to find the, the proper measure of how much you will consume this information and how much you will distract yourself with other things. I myself started bird watching <laughs> in this pandemic to think about other things. I think it's mainly um, an individual responsibility. And okay, I'll give you that. Uh, media and governors and priests and public figures could teach us this as well like this, like I, 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 you, I am trying to do in my, uh, in my columns and newspaper and my videos in YouTube, I say, okay, this is the information, you have to see the information, but don't forget to have some green areas in your day uh, for your brain to rest a little bit, otherwise we all will get sick. Marcus, your microphone is is up. On. Good. Now it, I think it's on. Okay. It's, no. Sorry. For a moment, I was I was out because of the internet here, but I'm back. Uh, now uh, there is a question uh, that is sitting there for Marcelo. Probably you 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 read it already. Uh, thanking you and asking your opinion. Uh, what is the role of the financial capitalism? Uh, in the in the global education industry, that's also a sort of a political question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, financial capitalism uh, is um, this is a very controversial term uh, that has been coined um, by those um, advocating for philanthropic capitalism and then co-opted by some researchers based uh, more generally um, sociologists um, trying to assess the impact of uh, these networks on uh, education policy. Uh, Stephen Ball has has been influential in this. He's uh, a colleague from, from the UK. Um, philanthropic capitalism has uh, had a a great potential uh, because simply of uh, because of the the amount of money they can invest 
uh, in, um, in trying to solve uh, problems, uh, educational issues uh, across the globe. There are, there are several um, in, interesting examples of this. But uh, from the research we've been conducted, uh, and Stephen Ball has, uh, has phrased it as these are angel investors, uh, which is an interesting way of uh, seeing these actors. Um, the issue I, I see most, or the, the, the problematic role of philanthropic capitalism in uh, education and higher education um, uh, policy and, 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 and the delivery of, of the service uh, is that the separation between um, uh, companies and foundations uh, is not always clear. For example, um, the Dell Foundation is one example out, out of many. They have funded pilots, uh, pilot projects in uh, India and um, in other places in, uh, in Southeast Asia um, that were very interesting and very useful in trying to improve um, learning contexts and um, using technology to um, improve education in the different countries. Um, so until here, I think this is an interesting and important contribution they can make. But at some point, uh, when foundations and companies start to lobby governments to buy um, hardware and software to uh, scale up these projects. Um, here you see that it stops to be philanthropy and it's um, for-profit uh, uh, activity because um, it's no coincidence that the Dell Foundation um, is, uh, or the, the, the Dell is able uh, to provide to sell uh, hardware to the companies. And imagine the size of the market in a country like uh, um, India or China, or even in smaller countries. Uh, here, the, the relationship between these uh, two branches, which um, uh, by law has to be separated, becomes very porous. And um, activities of the foundation and uh, the, the companies become uh, entangled to an extent that is um, very yourself, problematic in, uh, in um, policy terms. And, and also in here for terms. Danielle. Uh, well, the, 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 this question was from Natalia, uh, who made the question from Lisbon in Portugal. Uh, now we have one uh, from, from Tiago Tartar from here, from Sao Paulo. Uh, uh, Society sectors uh, uh, have denied pandemic, Danielle. Uh, does this have anything to do with the fear uh, of processing, uh, warning, or other psychological issues? Uh, do the far right movements that have recently risen uh, have uh, anything to do with this? So, again, people are asking uh, political <laughs> questions. How Yes, because we have we cannot run from it. <laughs> we have discussed it in one. Uh, we cannot run from it. In the in the first, just for you to know, in the first uh, one, of, uh, the first webinar that we have, we discussed that, and it was explained that this uh, this issue of the far right or far left or this division, the political division of the society is not a big issue for the Germans, but it's a big issue for, for Brazilians. And I believe it's a big issue for the Americans as well in many places in the world. Uh, so uh, the, the question I think goes, the Tiago's question goes towards this uh, thing of how the brain works and uh, yeah. what, how do you see that? Uh, looking at from from the from the brain point of view, I think uh, there are two reasons to deny the the pandemic. Uh, the first one is uh, what you have in our brain that's called normalizing bias. 
uh, it's a tendency for us to think that things will not change. No, everything will be okay, everything will keep normal, uh, there's nothing to be afraid of, uh, we don't need alarm, just wait and see. And it was very present in the, in the beginning of the pandemic. Even I felt for this normalizing bias in the very beginning of the pandemic. I thought, well, I don't think it will be all this trouble. Let us see. Uh, wait a second. So, of course, when the uh, evidence has come, you, can, you must be able to overcome uh, your bias and that's what uh, we require, we, we expect from people who are open to uh, dialogue, to discuss and to analyze evidences and so on. But there's a second reason for people to deny the pandemic, that is the, the political reason. And I don't, I don't know for sure that the denying of the pandemic it's a far right or even a right thing. I think maybe it's uh, the power thing. Maybe if the left was in, in the power or the far left was in the power, maybe, I don't know, I'm just speculating, maybe they should deny the, the pandemic. At least in the very beginning, because uh, for governments and for politicians, a pandemic it's a very very big problem. Uh, if people don't uh, don't don't leave their their houses, if the people don't work, if people don't buy, uh, all the economic structure suffers, and the power can be uh, can can see this as a menace. So. Uh, I don't know if it's a, a left thing or a right thing, but I know for sure that there is uh, that is enhanced by the polarizing uh, view of the world that we deal here in Brazil and they deal in America. And maybe, maybe I don't know, it will start uh, in Europe and even in in Germany because there is a tendency. Uh, as the words get, uh, as the word gets more and more complex, that people goes to the extremes because it's very hard and it's very uh, difficult for us to spend the energy to see all the gray uh, between the black and the white, and it's far more comfort to be in one of the the extremes. Because you don't have to think when you are in one extreme, you don't have to think about anything. You just know what's right and what's wrong, and you don't have to spend a single uh, energy to to think about things and to deliberate. Uh, and it goes for right and it goes for left. So I think as the world gets more complex, more people will go to extremes. But I understand it's a problem here, maybe a, a, a bigger problem here in Brazil than in Europe. And I think, yes, the polarization issues uh, make this problem more difficult to deal with. Because um, let's take any an example, the, the mask use. If the uh, right president, uh, right-oriented president says, you don't have to use mask. Everybody who shares this political view uh, goes and uh, repeating, "Oh, we don't have to use masks." Uh, and you understand if the uh, uh, left-oriented politician says the same thing, everybody goes uh, goes and, and says the same thing. So I think the polarization it's a, a, a trouble and a problem for us to deal with pandemic, and I have no doubt of, of it. Marcos, your microphone is mute. <laughs> was 
following your order. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'll, 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 make, I'll make one question uh, now, a final question for both of you, uh, and I would like you to answer, answer this question in about one minute. I, I know it's very difficult, but, uh, and, then, and then we finish. Uh, we have been experimenting, uh, at least from the point of view of what I see here, and uh, I, I don't know Europe, how Europe it is. Uh, is going now in, in, in this issue, uh, a sort of a loss of confidence in science. Uh, people, people distrust science nowadays. And uh, during the pandemics, uh, there was literally a big confusion of uh, people believing uh, pseudo specialists, people that are not really specialists talking about uh, about uh, the pandemic and uh, other people, other specialists speaking, and we see very, very curious things like very big specialists, very important specialists that we have here in Brazil. They don't have a, a so strong word as some people that are are not specialists in the in, in virology or the pandemics or in biology. Uh, this is this is really something. In the higher education, how do you see that, Marcelo? And uh, how do you see that, Danielle, in the brain? What's happening? Marcelo first, could be. I, I, can, I can start. I'm, actually, this this is a development that uh, has been already discussed in the early 90s. Um, uh, maybe I live in an echo chamber where I only hear what I uh, uh, I'm also able to to say, but um, I don't don't see a loss in, uh, in of of trust in uh, science. Rather more more trust. What we see uh, at the moment is a pluralization of, uh, um, of voices, um, competing visions of the same. And this is actually uh, nothing special for, uh, uh, for science. Science lives on multiple voices and very few questions can be um, decided um, in, a, in a simple way and say this is right and this is wrong. Of course, there are uh, in, in the natural sciences a, a, a few instances where you can do this, but yes, still, uh, I think uh, from a, we have a more philosophical uh, I position, this is, the, the um, is some part good, and parcel uh, of the, science. The, science the as a discourse, science is what as a social the, uh, practice. Uh, science fiction writer is Asimov, I think he said that the the problem of the the movement, the anti science anti science movement, uh, was convincing people that my ignorance has the same value as your knowledge. And when you have different knowledges and different voices competing for explanation, I think it's a, a salutary thing. It's a good thing. But when we when we are in an environment with so many fake news, with um, misleading information uh, broadcasted on purpose to confuse uh, and for some people to get uh, to to get advantage for from this confusion, I think we have a problem. And there's there's a it's a challenge because science is not meant to be easy. The scientific method, uh, it's counterintuitive. We have to question our, our ideas. We have, to, uh, we have to confront our hypothesis. And we have to build another hypothesis. And we have to, to review our convictions. And that's very, very challenging for uh, lay people to, to understand. So I think, and that's why I focus my career on my career on this I think we ought to popularize mm -hmm. science I think 
it's uh, a duty of university and of um, think of scientists. I, I think it's not for every scientist to do that. Someone will do research, someone will teach, and some of us will use our uh, efforts and our talents to popularize science and to make science popularization and to enhance the science literacy of people. If we are uh, uh, succeed, if we, su if we succeed in this uh, task, maybe we can uh, go to, na to na, uh, a better moment for people to understand and even to uh, discern between the plural, plural plurality of the voices um, telling apart what's good and what's not. Well, thank you very much. Uh, time has passed very quickly. Uh, unfortunately, we could we could stay more and uh, and uh, heat up this discussion and go ahead. But uh, we have uh, we have an amount of time to fill here. And I would like very much to thank you both, Marcelo and Daniel, for your presentations and for your answers. I would like to thank all the participants that made questions and the ones that didn't make didn't make questions as well. And this, this will be my last and uh, my third and, and, and last uh, uh, webinar uh, with, uh, with the friends, with the German friends. And I would like to thank you very much for uh, uh, choosing me uh, as a, a coordinator of this free meeting. Uh, before we finish, uh, not yet. Uh, like it's okay. I will call later, Marcus. Uh, and uh, I think they will be shown here now. Uh, the answers will be shown for you. Well, I, I want to thank you, uh, Marcus, and uh, also Marcelo and Daniel for this uh, Call later. So, uh, uh, outstanding talk to today. To it was thank you very, very, much, very interesting, so the presentations and the talk. And Marcus, so thank you very much once more for your engagement, moderating the first sequence of the three events of the Bayhar Sao Paulo Online Talks series. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, so um, with this event, uh, so we close uh, the first sequence of our online talks. Uh, to follow the agenda of events of the Bayhar Sao Paulo, as well as from German funding agencies, universities and scientific organizations linked to us, please follow us at Facebook and LinkedIn, but also sign our monthly newsletter about events and calls for opportunities. Write down or take uh, a picture of the slide with our website address where you can sign our newsletter. So, as I announced at the beginning, this online talk was recorded in both languages, Portuguese and German. And the videos will be available soon on our channel on YouTube. Before we close this transmission, I want to invite you for our next event, the Brazilian qualifying stage of the Falling Walls Lab Brazil 2020, an international contest for young researchers with transformative ideas. The event with 15 candidates will happen on this Thursday, 17th, on 4 p.m. Brazilian time, 9 p.m. German time. You find more information on our website and social media. So here we have once more again our survey. Please the survey. Please inform us some information about your activity, where you are, how did you know about this event, if you already know the VH, and giving us your evaluation of this third the VH Sao Paulo online talk. Again, if you are watching us on YouTube, 
you need to answer in the chat, please. Comments, criticism, and compliments are also welcome. Please use the chat. The survey will stay open for two minutes. After this time, the transmission will be closed. I thank you all for participating. Have a